Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting to order. First item on the agenda is the presentation of the colors by the Anthem High JRO team with everybody from the states. Oh, or Mark. Mark.
Okay, I know it's full of multiple on this one. I just felt that Ashley and John, you have a few comments to make. Is that all right? Come on, let me go. <laughs> Someone may have misinformed me, but that's okay. You're in the spotlight now. Okay, our uh, next Hero of the Ward, uh, Hero of the Herd Award, goes to a member of our certified staff. I'm going to let two people that know him very well say a couple of words about him. Okay, so I just wanted to say that everyone on our team just appreciates Coach Corbin so much. He sacrifices so much of his personal time for us. He does so much for us. He cares a lot about us. And like none of us, have, like none of us would have had as much success as we did without him in all of our years of running. And so we just thank him so much for it. Um, Coach Corbett's been with me since I was in sixth grade, and he always pushed me to be better than I am, and always believed in me more than I did. And he's done a lot for me in my life. And he's like a dad. Coach Corbett, uh, I can pick for any one of your student athletes up here. And they would have said the same thing. This is what a colleague said. Coach Corbett not only loves coaching across country, but he has created a program that's not just a team, but a family. On any given weekend or summer night, if you live in Coach Corbett's neighborhood, we won't disclose his address. You will see a group of runners from GHS stopping by his house to grab a drink uh, of water, water from his house. Talk from his water house. He's Fueling kids with the water hose, uh, talking to them. Uh, his wife is uh, part of the family too. The dogs are part of the family, and then they go on and finish their run. Uh, someone else wrote, "I spend, I watch them spend hours talking to parents about how this country can help their children build a future through further education." His active role in connecting students with potential scholarships and competing at the next level has led to an opportunity for many students that would have otherwise been painful. Uh, Mr. Corbett, your colleagues talk about the care. Love and attention that you bring to the students you set up yourself on a special class, special education classroom. Uh, you truly are an outstanding educator, coach, and human being. Congratulations, and you're a hero of the event. Uh, if you're a member of the Gainesville High School Cross Country team or track team, could you join us up front, please, for a photograph? All okay. This past Thursday and Friday, the Georgia School Board Association held its winter conference, and the Gainesville City Board of Education was awarded the 2021 GSBA Distinguished School Board Honor. The honor uh, to honor achievement and the pursuit of higher standards in the local governments and public schools for the second year in a row. Please join me in recognizing our Board of Education as a distinguished school board.
Um, do we have any more comments? Uh, just want to share many, many thanks to all the people who helped make the Christmas on Green very successful. Uh, thousands of fans, uh, lots of support from our students and our staff. Thank you. Anybody else? Do we have anybody from Leadership Hall here tonight? If you don't mind, uh, stand up, uh, tell us your name and tell us what organization you're with. Uh, my name is Chelsea Sullivan. I work for Rushton. Uh, I'm a CPA member of the Virginia Learning Alliance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, now is the end of the, uh, the awards recognition. It's a good time if you need to leave, leave before we get into our formal business. Thank you. Students with disabilities 
outperformed student disabilities across the state 79 percent to 70 percent and our students who are english language learners and we had a good number of those in high school outperformed the state 74 percent to 65 percent so we're incredibly incredibly proud of the effort of the educators that made that possible we're incredibly proud of the family members community members and students themselves for their stick with us and their group to get through a, what we consider to be a very rigorous academic program final focus this year uh, particularly as it aligns to our uh, efforts to graduate students is to support an improvement uh, in, in the culture of the school and one of the ways we measure it, this is through uh, tracking your behaviors good and bad uh, as we stand today uh, we have seen a 12 percent reduction in office referral this year a 50 percent reduction in assignments to iss a 10 percent reduction to assignments to oss and in every category of number of violations the number of referrals uh, we see a significant improvement of the, the number of students that are getting referrals. There are fewer students that are getting those referrals. So, you know, our, in our effort to uh, engage in the PBIS training, uh, kind of the buy in from faculty and staff, some of the trainings we've done in terms of you know, mental health and trauma informed uh, teaching and learning, uh, mental health awareness, uh, de escalation, uh, those are all working to support our students and help them stay in the classroom where we know they're getting exposure to great educators. Our attendance policy this year is new. You all know this. We believe that students learn best when they're here, when they're with our teachers. Uh, and so we uh, appreciate your support again uh, in establishing an attendance uh, policy which says that students cannot exceed 10 days uh, of, of school, uh, unexcused absences from school. Uh, research shows we're missing 10% of school days. Uh, that's about 18 days in total for the year. Uh, absolutely negatively affects students' academic performance. Uh, really, that's just two days a month, uh, and that's termed as chronic uh, as chronic absence, absenteeism. Uh, where students improve their attendance rate, can improve their academic prospects, and the chances of graduating. We took the metrics from 2017 to 2018, 2019. We didn't count COVID yet, and then we're looking at where we are today. Uh, in the first quarter, uh, this is the percentage of our students missing 10% or more school days in the first quarter. In 2017, that was 31%. In 2018, it was 22%. In 2019, it was 19%. In this year, we're at 13%. So, over a very short period of time, we, we dramatically improved that attendance. It doesn't always feel that way, uh, but the data shows that to be the case. And again, we do think part of that is that students realize that that accountability is important. Our AP program, uh, particularly under the leadership of our gifted teachers and Mr. Sheeman, continues to grow. Uh, we've grown uh, this year up to 358 students from 267 students. Uh, we've seen a 34% uh, overall increase in the number of test takers and a 28% increase in the number of tests taken. Uh, we've seen uh, and we celebrate a 70% increase in African American students enrolled. In, uh, in AP courses taking AP tests, and 155% increase in Hispanic students enrolled and taking AP tests. Uh, we're an AP STEM school, an AP STEM achievement school, and an AP STEM access and support school, which means that uh, we're recognized for promoting diversity in our programs and our students are being successful. Uh, we've seen an increase this year in our ACT competence score, 21.5, is the highest we've had in a five year period. Same is true for our SAP composite score. A couple of points of pride, you know this, we, we recognize the, uh, the, the young men involved in our Skills USA competition. Uh, and again, it gives us a chance to thank you for your investment in uh, our new workforce development building, the Advanced Study Center. A great story to share with you. We sat on the IRB boards this, uh, this last week, where we heard students in AP research, research propose their projects. Uh, one such we had a number of proposals that really was a fulfillment of, of your vision for that building. Uh, students in AP research uh, investigating problems across the hallway with our science teachers. Students in that building, AP research, investigating urban farming uh, and uh, water stress on farming, working with an engineering teacher and a construction teacher. Uh, so that vision is happening early and we're really excited to see what they're able to do with those projects. Uh, finally, the last thing I want to bring up uh, on 
Thursday, we will be signed, Dr. Williams will be signing an agreement with the University of North Georgia. We are a recipient uh, of one of the TRIO grants for us, it's Talent Search, and this will allow 500 students uh, in Gainesville City School System to come under the wing and, and the guidance and the counsel of leaders from the University of North Georgia to assist them in the college applications, assist them in the financial aid applications, conduct SAT and ACT workshops, conduct dual enrollment workshops, host academic uh, enrichment opportunities, and host college visits for students who may be our first generation or are economically disadvantaged. So again, we continue to try and find ways to inspire those and challenge uh, our students. Uh, that's my presentation on the school update. Are there any questions that I can answer? Any questions, Mr. Green? Those 500 students, Mr. Green mentioned, the sixth grade through 12th grade. So we've got a great span of seven years to target 500 students. And, and you mentioned that that guidance would be coming from the University of North Georgia. So we're partnered with the University of North Georgia. They are hiring right now a, a director for this, this particular grant, this program for Gainesville High School. So we'll be working closely with them over the next three months to have those students. Uh, identify, signed up, and start working with them to try and get them to that next step. Any other questions? One, one other question that I had. So I know several years ago when our campus had so many buildings and kids being spread out and walking up and down the hill and all that. So now that we have the Advanced Studies Center and the new uh, cafeteria and media center opening, how much less traffic are we seeing that uh, we're still having to use the Night Creek Center? But is it helping a little bit? Well, right now it's probably the worst we'll see it because they're going everywhere. <laughs> we have the new buildings and the old buildings, and then the old buildings we have to walk around to get the new buildings. Uh, so the lot, <laughs> there's a lot of traffic and a lot of spread, uh, but I am convinced that once we open uh, the new cafeteria media center, once we get the schedule right for that building and getting kids in that deep, uh, we'll, we'll see a bit of a drop in, in the overall contract across the campus. But I do know that once we get that new academic building open, uh, that will be a real game changer for us. And we are, I have lots of administrators here, we are thrilled for that. Uh, and looking forward to it. All right, Mr. Green, does anyone want to talk to us about schedule change? Yes, sir. And the process that is going behind it? Yes, sir. So, you know, we, we, one of the things that we do when we meet as a team, uh, we do it on an ongoing basis. This is, and I say team, the administrative team, the faculty leadership team, the faculty of call, myself and the School Governance Council. We, you know, we're constantly asking ourselves, what can we do to get better? Right? We want, we want a kind of approach change from uh, a mindset that it can be good uh, if it's managed well, it can be good if it helps more of our students to, uh, you know, meet those goals we set for. Uh, so, in doing that, one of the questions that has come up was, can we look at a schedule that um, kind of better prepares our students to be successful? More of our students to have more success. That's what we want. More of our students to have more success. Uh, so, for the past couple of years now, we, we've been kind of coming back to this question. Uh, it started with some discussions in early 2019 with the School Governance Council. Um, and that led to the formation of a study group that we, we engaged, included administrators, counselors, and faculty members. Uh, that group uh, went out uh, and, and did a whole bunch of studies. We did a literature review. We, did, we had some focus group discussions. We also went out and we visited schools. We looked at schools like ours that had numbers like ours, that had student groups like ours that are being successful. Uh, and looked at their schedule and said, how are you doing it? And a lot of those visits really, what I would call would be a deep dive. Uh, we went out and, and you know, looked at how the teachers assign, how the students schedules, what time are they moving, how does it affect all of these programs? Uh, we engaged our faculty leadership uh, team again this year. We kind of re, we brought that question back now that we've we built, kind of getting through COVID. Uh, we brought it back to our school governance council uh, and that's that's kind of what I want to present to you tonight is all of those discussions, you know, what have we kind of landed on? Where are we in the process? So next slide, please. When we when we think about changing something, we can't do it unless it's driven by a desire to improve student achievement. That's why we're here. Uh, and so you know. 
There's no schedule that automatically improves achievement. That, you know, there's lots of studies going on. There's no magic answer to this anywhere. If I could figure it out, I'd be a very wealthy man. Um, but there are things that we can do um, that we know along the way help improve student achievement. One of the things that, uh, particularly for our students in situations that they're in, one of the things that we want to do is have a schedule that uh, allows us to better deliver on the initiatives that, that we're looking to, um, to do in line with our district priorities. Uh, so one is our focus on literacy. Uh, the idea that you can be a student who maybe does not have the strongest English skills, takes an English class in the first semester of your freshman year, and then waits until the second semester of your sophomore year, a whole year later, makes it very difficult to have any real effect in, uh, in, the, in that student's growth as an English speaker. Uh, it makes it more difficult to have a meaningful NTSS program. Uh, by the time teachers are already getting to know their students, let's say November, they're getting ready to hand them off to a new group of teachers. And so that knowledge that you can use to put those interventions and those supports in place and track the growth, that opportunity disappears for the most part in January. Uh, we want to provide easier transitions to students. Uh, as Dr. Williams shared with the board a while ago, last year's graduating class of 483 seniors at, at one point included up to 800 students. So we had a lot of students in that. Uh, you can see here a map uh, of the schools that surround us that are on a seven period day. We have students who come to, the, to us from these schools every day. And so the difficult part is when they come in October and they've been on seven periods, we have some really difficult scheduling conversations. When they come in February, we have even more difficult scheduling conversations. It's the same when our students leave us and go somewhere else. And we want to make sure, you know, our, our responsibility for them doesn't end the minute they leave out the gates of high school's uh, front door. It continues to be successful where they go to. We want to provide more opportunities for students to enroll and succeed in AP programs. If you have a student in an AP program, you know that we're forced on this new on our block to have students take a course in uh, the first semester and then sit for an AP exam, which determines whether or not they get college. It has a financial impact on families six, seven months later. Now, the AP, board, the AP uh, college board itself recommends year long classes for AP courses. And when we've done that in the past, we've had to do that sometimes, we double block them and it's a massive drain on, on human resource and really limits the number of students that can take those courses. Uh, we want to avoid the need, as I said, for double blocking. We want to reduce the need for uh, the impact of student absenteeism. Uh, we want to provide more hours of instruction in English and math particularly. Uh, you can see here, this is, uh, these are our students in the district, sixth through eighth grade. Uh, and you can see across the board, we're essentially at 70% of our students are beginning or developing learners. I know there's a lot of great things going on in, in, in all of the schools to address this and support our students. But again, to think about how we can grow students, how we can help students in math, if, if there's no continuity. You know, I, I, I have a trouble remembering something I heard on Friday or Monday. But can you imagine having to learn algebra semester one and then wait an entire year? use it and, and help you with job training. That's just very difficult for the majority of our students. Uh, I've already men mentioned RTI and MPSS. Uh, another factor is, uh, simply put, a four by four block schedule uh, puts a strain on your ability to be creative and scheduled. Uh, with only four opportunities a day and 2,300 students, it makes it difficult to do things like common planning uh, because if you have an entire department up in one period, that only leaves you three opportunities to schedule. And so we, we believe that a change could help us be more flexible and getting students matched with the right classes. And finally, uh, we want to uh, kind of eliminate the disruption or minimize the disruption that December had on learning. Um, our students that are taking the EOC next semester, so our students in algebra, our students in American literature or uh, US history, have 68 days next semester. 68 days. To learn a course and then to show and then to show us what they know and it's high stakes. Uh, we believe that uh, we would be better at serving if we had the entire length of the year to do that. Uh, on the next page, you see a breakdown of some of the changes 
uh, sort of differences between the two schedules. Um, you can see that although well, four by four block, the average class time is 85 minutes versus a 50 minute uh, class time on a seven period day. And that could probably go to about 53, 54 minutes, truthfully. Um, the total instructional time per segment and hours is quite a bit higher on the seven period day. And again, you take away the, the destruction of the EOC tests in the middle of the year, and that number actually goes up. Sorry, it goes down on four by four block. Um, there's uh, there's a, a potential gain there in teacher utilization, uh, making sure. And again, we believe in the quality of our teachers that our teachers get to serve more of our students. Uh, there is a, a drop in the number, total number of credits available, um, 28 versus 32. But uh, remember, we require 23 for graduation and. and I know that we have plenty of students that if they want extra credits, we've always supported that. Uh, so we, we don't see that being a barrier. Uh, the unfunded segments for FTE, uh, we are funded for six. That's it. Uh, and if we deliver eight, uh, then we're doing two for each, uh, for each one that's unfunded. So there's a difference there in unfunded segments. Uh, the one day absence impact, you can see that the difference. Uh, each day that you miss, not only for the, for the block schedule, you know, is your one day a high percentage of your course, you also have less time to make up. Uh, and so when we have interruptions, be it from a global pandemic, uh, you know, a disruption in the household, uh, an emergency trip, uh, that, that block schedule makes it very difficult for students to recover. Uh, finally, you can see that there is a difference over the number of transitions, and it's something that we I should certainly pay attention to if we do decide to make change. Okay, the next part. So, uh, here are some of the considerations we've already made AP offerings and sequencing. Uh, we do not anticipate any change in the number of AP classes that take great pride in offering more AP classes than any other school around us, and we uh, feel very confident that we'll continue to do that. Um, Students not coming through, I'm uh, sorry, students coming through already on an AP track. So I think I started this pathway. Uh, may need us to sit down with them and work out what the plan that they had now looks like. Uh, but we've already started those conversations and drawn out several schedule options for those students. What it would look for look like a junior or a sophomore or a freshman who's already in that program or, or an upcoming freshman who wants to be in that program. Uh, we looked at the dual enrollment schedule. We've worked with our dual enrollment count, uh, dual enrollment lead in the district of Tonti. We've also been speaking to colleges and universities and have a plan there to continue to offer uh, courses on and on campus. We'd like to offer more on campus uh, and we'll block those periods together. So that will look more like a traditional block for those students. Uh, we don't see any uh, dramatic change for, for athletics, theater, band, and you can see our labs. Uh, we'll, we'll work on some schedules. I uh, try and put them in positions where if they need some extra time, we can do that. You know, we, that's kind of on our next steps. But, um, you know, what, what I have heard is, you know, one of the reasons my child doesn't do that, one of the reasons my child doesn't do theater, is because right now they have to have eight credits. Eight credits of their 32. And those courses, I had a band parent say, I think my child had a master's degree in band, or they were here. Uh, and so this would kind of allow us not to have to course eight, eight of their 32 credits. In those subjects. Um, remedial programs, uh, we're looking to develop a schedule that includes some intervention time uh, and also for math and English support class. So we feel that the things that are really important to us, for our students, the things that we do well, we're going to, we would be able to do, continue to do, if we did make a schedule change. Uh, so the last, last thing that we have here in my presentation are next steps. Um, we, we're, we're about ready to start scheduling for next year. Uh, so if we make this switch, we're going to have to start meeting with parents, communicating with parents, uh, talking through what this would look like for them next year, whether they're, again, rising math graders, rising seniors. There's going to be implications here on what plan they may have. Uh, we're going to develop the finalized bell schedule. Uh, we've got to conduct some professional learning and curriculum review for the changes. Uh, talk about grading policies. You know, are we doing semester grades, quarterly grades? How do we recover grades? Do we... If we issue a grade at midterm and then at the end of the year, if the students met match three, we then issue the grade for you know, the credit. Uh, so a lot of those discussions are, are, are taking place, uh, but I think our, where we are right now is really to have those discussions that this is something that we'll be able to do. Thank you. Uh, 
personally think this is a great move, long overdue as a parent. Um, uh, so I committed all the work this morning. Yeah, I know there's still a lot of work left ahead. But, uh, that's a comment for me. I don't know if any of my colleagues uh, would chime in or ask us to bring any questions. I'd like to add that I was a student on the block and a student on six period a day. And when you do have a foreign language, let's say the first semester of one year, and you don't have it again until the second semester of the next year for math, it just creates you creates an opportunity that unless that's your area, you're going to struggle. One thing that you may get to board members is well, they're going from eight to seven, so that's fewer opportunities for my student, for my child. Think of it like this. Right now, in eight periods, if you sign up for band or drama or weight training, that's two of your eight classes. That leaves you six periods for the or six credits for the rest of the school year. You got seven periods in a day, only one of those now is tied up with those options. It's still six. So you're not losing opportunities um, that when you look at the eight to seven. Another thing that we talked a little bit about is attention span. You know, youth today and adults today, our attention span is not what it probably used to be. And you try to sit through an 85 minute class and a lot of different transitions, it takes effective planning to do that efficiently. Uh, being able to go to less time, being uh, more impactful over the, the period of a year. And the third one is what impact does have on our middle school courses and high school credit at the middle school level? So we've had conversations and we're planning to reinstitute Spanish for high school credit. We're looking to do business as well. And then a, a year after next, we'll be looking to do construction and um, healthcare science as well. And so we've got a plan in place to be able to seed some of the opportunities so when the kids get to the high school, they can get those upper level courses that junior and senior year. And that's really what we want. We want to do work based on dual enrollment, AP that junior and senior year. And this will help us uh, do that in a more controlled and structured uh, way. So it's, it's certainly a consideration, and I think part of what we would need to do, I didn't include that in, in next steps, is sort of how we locate teachers. You know, you can take sophomore classes in, in English, math, science, and social studies and locate them closely to each other. So there may be some travel for, for electives, but really eliminates the majority of the travel that they have to do. Uh, from the ninth grade center, uh, our hope would be that if we were to do this, is to take all ninth grade classes up at the ninth grade center. Uh, they might have an electable two to come down for, but we put those at the points in the day where they're not up and down all day. We, we will be the high school with the most steps <laughs> in the country. <laughs> yes. well, that's how I guess the middle school does it. If they have four academic classes and then they all go together to two activity classes. Yes. So, so is it safe to assume that, that a student would always have four, the four four subjects throughout their entirety of their time of being alive? Yes, sir. And I think I know the answer to this, but just to, to make sure I'm clear, every class would be a year-long class. So if I, if I take R, I'm going to have a period of R from September all the way through May. Um, the majority of our classes would be year long, but there would be an opportunity to learn some half credit courses. So, for example, government and economics. Uh, we only require a student to have a half credit in government and a half credit in economics. We, until this year, we forced them to take a full credit in each. Um, so now we're doing half credit, but that's really a, a nine week course, so it's very, very difficult. Uh, but it does allow us theoretically. To allow some allow some more uh, more offerings of electives. A lot of schools on the same period day are able to offer uh, kind of core electives. So in the school that I came from, we had uh, you know citizenship courses and social studies and law you know law and, and justice courses. We had uh, in English we had genre based reading courses. Uh, so it just it just gives you the opportunity to, to offer some half credit electives to students. One of the things that, that is nice about us being a charter system is in some cases for our advanced learners, we can put two credits into one course. If we know that the pacing can be accelerated, we would be able to give uh, more than one credit uh, to that in the previous district and it really help open up the doors for that junior and senior year. 
But once again, that's an environment that, that has not been fleshed out at all. Uh, but this is in the conversation piece. So when the schedule starts to uh, be worked on a little bit here in the next couple months, there's good direction about where to go. Mr. Green and his team, I know over the next six weeks, you're going to be extremely busy with basically having to do a whole nother school year next semester because we are on lock. Who passed, who failed, who's missing this. Uh, one thing that helped, I believe, in our conversation with a lot of this as well is that the state, when they reduced the EOCs that were required, it allows us to get a little more flexible uh, with some of our course options. Uh, Mr. Green, comment, if you will, on the difference to expect in, with teacher preparation, teacher preparation. Yeah, so um, we, that's one of the things we have to review is what that teacher load looks like. Um, one of the things that's typical now is that a lot of our teachers actually have to, they may have, let's say, two different preps one semester, but then the next semester, they may have two different preps. So that change at the semester uh, can prove very difficult uh, to kind of spin on and, and, and be part of a different PLC team. Here, what we would expect, uh, our aim would be to minimize the number of preparations for each pass. Uh, so still, to try to limit it to two, uh, most two preps per feature. There are going to be some exceptions to that. Um, and, and where appropriate, uh, and again, it has to be reviewed here, look at is it, is it feasible that we can allow teachers to teach five or seven? The teachers need to teach six or seven, or can there be some consideration for which teachers teach five? So for example, in school that I came from in Boston, if you're an AP teacher, you taught ESOL or special ed, you taught five or seven. Everyone else taught six or seven. So we have to work through some of those things, but our aim would be ultimately to map to, to keep two breaths is the max for any teacher, and we would also then avoid having to change at the semester. You will, of course, give us advance notice of your most irate employees. Yes, sir. I think you probably already know. But I will say this, you know, we have a lot of people that, uh, we have a lot of people that are really excited about the prospect of this change, a lot of people that aren't. Um, and How many years ago did what, what this lock? I think it was 98. Yeah, it says late 90s. I think to add to the employees, I think you need to have a script ready to for those parents of sophomores and juniors to talk about the legs about how it may affect their kids going to the block. Just mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the biggest thing with the junior. Like, I, I see all the merits of this. Like, I, I do think it's a good. Uh, idea, but you know, those kids that are already kind of midstream, I just said, how do they do One thing I'd like to add is, and the middle school, school, and the middle school kids who would just begin the high school experience, that, that's as critical as anything. Yes, we'll be doing two weeks in February with transition activities, and that's when we hit a lot of those pieces. I know my elementary parents would be glad I'm adding this in. If their teachers had 85 minutes of planning today, they would absolutely love it. So in those conversations with the teachers, elementary with five preps and only 40 minutes at best with bathroom break built in, it's okay. Can I get the last one out for uh, any other questions or comments to address on the screen? Uh, I would like to suggest a uh, scheduled update on this implementation. Uh, you can do it in writing, it uh, does not matter, but uh, at least keep us abreast of each major step. That is uh, between now and June. Yes, sir. Thank you. Is it? Thank you, Mr. Greenberg. Thank you. All right. Are there any discussion items? One item for everybody for tomorrow. Uh, we will re unveil the Wine College Hotel uh, Memorial plaque at the high school at 4 30. Everybody is invited. 
4.30 in front of the high school. Uh, it's a small but significant program on the anniversary of the uh, Lion Call Control Fire. Tomorrow at 4.30. Mr. Chair, if I could, I'd like to recognize Ms. Brown and Ms. Shields, who are here with us tonight. The personnel report is going to be approved here in a little bit after executive session as they're retired as home there. And so to both of those wonderful leaders in our school district, a few years combined between the two of you in Kansas City Schools, just want to both and say we love you and we miss you in May, but we still got you for six months. Well, we're uh, very much to be adjourned into the executive session. So, a motion by Mr. Smith. Second. Second by Dr. Randy. All those in favor? Thank you, everyone, for coming.